Hi, I'm Arjun, and I have Sumi here with me, who is a principal architect of our, of our core platform. In this video, we're going to talk a little bit about extensibility. You know, why is extensibility important? You know, banks have, the softwares in, in a bank are really, really complex. Uh, and when you think about, about you, you always need software that can just do not just what it's supposed to do, just out of the box, but you should be able to extend that functionality. It's, let me try to explain this with an with a analogy here. An example of a system that is not very really extensible, it works great as a packaged app, is something like QuickBooks or TurboTax. It works fantastic out of the box. But to add another custom work, custom step in a TurboTax, unless TurboTax comes up with a new version of it, it you, can't, you can't really customize that one. Same thing with PayPal. It's a fantastic piece of software, but try to make anything that is custom for you unless PayPal launches a new piece of software, you can't extend that. Now contrast that with something that an Oracle offers or an SAP offers. These are very big software solutions, and these are complex software solutions. But you buy a, 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 an SAP, you know, you can actually customize that, right? I mean, you remember yes. all, the, all the things that you, you do, you customize that software. Well, it, it creates a, its own set of problems of over-customization, but the fact is you can actually customize that piece of software. Now, in a bank, it's actually a little more complex than that because you absolutely need customizability, but you want this to, to be done in a way whereby you can customize it but still interoperate with other, other parts of a bank. So let me try to explain that uh, with a diagram here. You know, just, just look at this part of it. You know, think about, about two banks, Bank A and Bank B, and essentially you think about a transaction that Bank A and Bank B are doing. This could be a trade, this could be a payment obligation, this could be a, uh, uh, it could be a swap that they have executed. Essentially, after the trade is done, they have to interact and, and actually execute a workflow, a business workflow across two different banks. And so you're now, for the first time, you're actually going to cross trust boundaries of a bank. You know, if it's obviously if everything is done here, it's easier. But you now need to do a business workflow that is going to be done partially here and partially here. And essentially, this is where the power of the distributed workflow or a, or, a, or a distributed ledger comes into play. And so at a very high level, this is what we do, right? We, we allow bank A to operate a node. You know, it, it is a distributed ledger, but it operates a node A. Bank B to operate a node B. And we talked about this a little bit about single tenant. So node A's data is not is, is going to be local to node, node to bank A. Node B's data is uh, node or bank B's. And node B is going to be operating within the security realm of node B, of bank B. Now, having said that, you still need to execute a workflow, a business workflow across these things. So what's an example of a workflow, right? All of this is part of the ISTA contract, and, and Sumi will get into that in a, in a little bit about the ISTA contract. Let's talk about FX. FX trades are done, FX trades are going to be netted, the netted trades are going to be agreed, and then it's going to be settled. I mean, it's a simple you know, three-step process. But this process is going to be done across two different banks which essentially means that you're going to do this across two different nodes. Now let's say that node A comes and says, you know what, after I do my, my, my trades, I have to do a custom step that is only for bank A. And that's going to be very different from bank B. You know, it's going to say, I have to run a check against my internal systems to make sure that the data is in sync. So I'm just making an example here. I need to run a custom step. That custom step may not be required for node B. So you see right away, that you need to be able to take the software that a, that a provider has done and be able to extend that piece of software to add a custom step. And this is again going back to the TurboTax. No, that's not possible unless TurboTax launches a new one. And this is where when we designed the software at Baton, we needed to make sure that a customer or a bank will be able to extend the Baton software, add custom steps to this. And how do we do that? Sumi is going to get into that in a, in, a, in a little bit. But essentially, this is what the realm of, of extensibility is. And that extensibility is important because we cannot go and define uh, or dictate a language. Because this is where the blockchains actually don't do a really good job. And unfortunately, you know, the, the thing is you have to write this in a particular language. A smart contract has to be written in Solidity or a language like that, which is not Turing complete. It does not blend itself very well to the interoperability that we talked about. So you needed something that can you can extend one and interoperate with existing systems of a bank. And so this is what Baton does. So what are the core things of this? One of the things that is very core is a domain model. And then there's a distributed workflow. So now I'm going to give this to Sumi to explain what a domain model does and why a domain model is important. How do you make sure that it's not, it's not a 
It's not a piecemeal solution for one particular workflow. It is actually a framework that can be extended across multiple workflows. And how do you preserve the lineage and all that stuff? So over to you, Sami. How do you talk a little bit about the domain model? Yeah. Uh, so before I start off on this, so I just wanted to say that the green strips are the one that are visible to both the banks. Whatever that Arjun said about the customization is visible only to the bank. No A. Whatever node A does as his custom strips need not be known by node B as long as they move through the contract, that's all they care for. And keeping that in mind, let's take a little bit, uh, um, a step backwards and talk about what we mean by the domain model and how is it different from a data model. So the data model talks about the structure of the data and while that is important, that only gets us through at some point, it does not allow for customization, whereas a domain model will actually talk about the life cycle of a contract and what are the steps that you can incorporate at which steps are can you customize and which steps are you visible to the external world or other party. So let's start, this is an example. So we have a contract, the contract goes through certain steps and for example, a new trade contract comes and based on how the data is, we decide to split into multiple contracts so you get a notification saying that the contract is split and you have these many contracts and you have a fee for that. And these two contracts again can be aggregated and I can go through an aggregation process and the aggregated contract can come as a new contract with a fee. And some contacts can be terminated, so it goes through a termination process and the contract will be updated with a fee. So this is what we talk about as a different stages into uh, your contract, a life cycle of a trade. And those life cycles are now controlled by the bank within for their own customizations and at any point can they interact with their own internal systems for more operability. Yeah. So you can see that, look, this is a complex life cycle of a trade. And this can happen from the time this, this initial first one happens to sometime here. You can have 90 days or more that can go on and thousands, tens of thousands, millions of these going on in parallel. And you can see, really, this is actually a workflow that is being done. And these workflows have got steps that are going to execute across two different banks. And that is what makes this complex in this. And you needed something to say, Look, I want to add a custom step between split and, and, and the new trade contract specific for Bank A. You should be able to do that. And that is where the extensibility piece is important. Because like I said, there is no one size fits all. Every bank is different. And so what we have done here with the domain model is shown you the complete life cycle. We also preserve the lineage. You can see this fee that originated from a, that, that was a result of a partial termination, that was a result of a contract, that was a result of a split, and you can draw the complete lineage of that. And an important part of the lineage is that in a, in a centralized model, you can have one person that stores the data and that's fine. In a distributed model, there is no one place where the data is there, which basically meant that we had to do what is called a notarized service, which is to say, I'm going to store this data in multiple places. How do you make sure that which data is correct? And so we needed to have what is called in the blockchain world, it's called the proof of existence. So Baton does the, what is called the proof of existence to make sure that there is a single source of truth or there is a, there is a, there is a source of truth and we can cryptographically prove that both parties had agreed to a certain contract on a certain stage and this was done using the public key, private keys and we can, we can demonstrate that that as, as a, a certain terminal state was it was reached as a result of all of this happening. And so this is these are all very important building blocks as we think about extensibility. I'm sure we spoke a lot of things, a lot of constructs. You will have many more questions. Please reach out to our, our sales team or our pre-sales team. We will be happy to jump on a call with your tech team and, and get into more details. Thank you again for watching uh, and we'll be in touch soon.